you've got a new album out that I want to talk about and uh, we'll, we will certainly get to that. Can we start off by telling me about the Ivies that you joined way back when? What was happening in your life when you got involved with that band? I, uh, I was in Liverpool. Uh, I'd been playing around doing stuff and uh, Gary Walker and the Rain had broken up. Uh, which was the band before uh, I was in the in the uh, you know when I joined the Badfinger band or the Ivies uh, as you say, um, so really I was just kind of fooling around in Liverpool, not really doing a lot, but uh, you know playing a little bit here, a little bit there, writing a few songs now and again, you know. But um, it was nice to get the phone call, uh, and apparently they had this record that they'd made with Paul McCartney. Uh, for some reason, without going into a long story, the bass player left. The bass player, Ron Griffith, left the Ivies, and they decided to... Uh, somebody recommended me for the job, uh, coming in and playing with them. And at that time as well, uh, uh, Tommy Evans, who was a guitar player in the Ivies, decided he was going to play bass. And uh, they decided to get a guitar player, and somebody recommended me. And I was invited to come and audition for the band. How old were you at the time? I was 23 years old. Ah, oh, okay. And what had you been doing till that time? I mean, apart from mucking around with music, were you... Well, I'd, I'd, I'd played in Liverpool uh, starting when I was about 15, 16. Uh, I ended up in a band called The Masterminds, made my first record with those, uh, was recording of a Bob Dylan song. Uh, produced by uh, the Rolling Stones manager, oh. Andrew Lou Goldham, uh, sweetheart and uh, great producer, as you know. And uh, he, he heard us doing this song while the Rolling Stones were, were at a show in, in Liverpool. And uh, they came for a drink at the club we were playing at. And uh, that was that. Um, he took us to London and made the record which came out and it didn't, didn't do great, but it did okay. Right. You know, it got in like the top 40 or something like that. What record so, was that? What was the, what was it the was thing? It was called She Prepare? Belongs to Me. Uh, and it was on Immediate Records, uh, which was Andrew Lou Goldham's record label. Um, immediate Records and, uh, you know, uh, and like I say, it came out and the whole thing was good. Right. It was a very tight musical community there in Liverpool, wasn't it? You all knew each other. Every band knew the, the other's members and you all hung and, and, and were, were friendly with one another, weren't you? Yes, it was. Yeah. It Can you was. describe describe those days in Liverpool? Because that's exactly where the Beatles came out of, wasn't it? It was. Uh, and I joined, I joined that scene, you know, the whole cabin thing when I was you know, maybe 14, 15, you know, it wasn't a drinking club, the cabin, uh, so anybody could go. Uh, when I was 15, I was working on the docks in Liverpool, and I'd, I'd, be in, I'd be in the city, in the town, during my lunchtime, and we'd go to lunchtime sessions. And uh, I started to see those bands, uh, you know, the cabin, uh, the Beatles, uh, the Searchers, Jerry and the Pacemakers, um, I started to see all those bands playing, and uh, they were all so good. It was kind of scary, you know, um, just frightening for a young guy like me. As I say, I was 15 then, 14, 15. Uh, uh, it was just great. But fortunately for me, I, um, I met a guy in town at lunch one day. He saw me walking on the street, and uh, he asked me if I was Joey Molland. And I said, yeah. And he said, um, I used to watch you playing on the street corners in Liverpool, in, in Penny Lane and stuff, which is where I grew up in that area. And uh, apparently my guitar playing impressed a few people in those days when I was a kid. And uh, he asked me, uh, did I have a guitar? And I told him, yeah, I did. And he said, would you like to come and play with our band tonight? And... Uh, I said, well, you know, I don't really play that much. You know, I only know like me Chuck Berry and some Buddy Holly and don't really know a lot, you know, because I've been playing by myself, really. A uh, little bit of a band in school called The Assassins. Uh, we lasted about six months. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, 
He said, oh, bring it down, that'll be great. Bring your guitar and come down. So I went down there that night and played, uh, and they really enjoyed it. They said it was great, and they paid me a pound, uh, which was remarkable. I only made two pound 15, two pounds and 15 shillings and eight pence a week working on the docks. So <laughs> a pound for one night was great. You know, so, uh, and they invited me down the next night, so I, play, I came and played again. Um, it was great. It all worked out really good. Amazing. When you say you'd been playing on street corners, were you actually busking? Uh, no, no, it was a little bit before that. Uh, I was actually learning to play. I was learning those Chuck Berry songs, learning the Buddy Holly songs, a little bit of Everly Brothers and that, you know. Um, so I was just really learning to play. And this was, of course, when I was 11. I started playing when I was 11 years old. Right. And... Uh, you know, by the time I was 15, I could I can somewhat play. You know what I mean? Uh, we did... Uh, well, that, that really tells the story, really. Right. Uh, so, when you, so, when you, so when you joined the Ivies, that was it? You stopped working on the wharf and, and made well, music no, the, the Ivies was The Ivies was many years later. Like I say, I was 15 when I was doing that. And I'd been playing on the corners... Uh, since I was like 12 or something, 11, 12 years old. The uh, playing with the profiles came when I was 15, 16 years old, uh, maybe maybe even 17. And uh, it was from there that I made my, uh, that introduced me to the Liverpool music scene, really. And uh, I started to go out to other clubs and see other bands playing. Mm -hmm. um, one of those places I went to was a club called the Blue Angel, which was a late night club. Um, and you'd see a lot of musicians in there and a lot of girls dancing and stuff was great. And uh, I'd get up with the band there, excuse me, a band uh, called the Masterminds. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, that, you know, that band, they were really good. They were really good band, and eventually the the uh, the guitar player in that band left. He decided he didn't want to be, uh, be a guitar player in the band anymore, and he went out and got a regular job. Brian Slater, his name was, mm -hmm. uh, really lovely guy. I still know him to this day. Uh, great friend of mine. Uh, we've had our in ups and downs, but he's a great friend of mine. Uh, Anyway, boy, it's a long story. You sure you want to go into this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want all your stories. I've got plenty yeah. of time. As long as you you got the time to share with us, well, you want to hear them all. Yeah, it was uh, wow. The um, let's see. Well, I, I eventually, of course, I, he left the band. Brian Slater left the Masterminds, and they asked me to join, uh, and I did. Um, the profiles weren't playing much, and uh, Peter had become a bit the singer and songwriter in the profiles had become a kind of a recluse uh, as it happened I haven't seen him since that day to today uh, I haven't seen him I've tried uh, but he doesn't he doesn't see anybody so you can't do much about that um, the masterminds worked out good for me but uh, one day we were recording and uh, the Rolling Stones came in I mean we were playing the Rolling Stones came in with their manager, Andrew Oldham, and he heard us doing a Bob Dylan song, She Belongs to Me. Mm -hmm. um, and he really liked it. And he asked us, did we want to go and make a record in London? And, and, and of course, we all jumped at the chance. And, um, it was great, man. We got to go to London. We recorded at Regent Sound. Uh, Andrew produced us. Uh, and the record came out. Uh, you know, a month later, six weeks later. What record uh, was that? She Belongs to Me, uh, oh. the Bob Dylan song. Right. With, uh, the B-side was written by uh, the bass player and uh, guitar player from the, from the Masterminds. That was uh, George Cassidy, uh -huh. uh, who's still, still a good friend of mine. Uh -huh. And, uh, and, and uh, Dougie Meekin, who, who was really at the time became my, really my best friend in the world. Uh, so anyway, the record came out, She Belongs to Me, and uh, got in the top 40. It didn't do great, but, I mean, it got in the top 40, which wasn't bad. And uh, we started playing around England and doing all that stuff. And 
did that for a couple of years. And of course, I got, got to be a better player and a better singer. And, uh, you know, the band had a great reputation in Liverpool, the Masterminds. Yeah. You, you were still band. a teenager at this time, weren't you? I was still a... Teenager. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, I was. I was maybe 18, you know, uh, something like that. Uh, and then I, uh, the, the Masterminds, um, several members of, of the Masterminds, including myself, were asked to join another band called uh, the Fruit Eating Bears, which was going to be uh, the backup band for a, 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 a singing duo from Liverpool called the Merseys. Uh, and they'd made a record called Sorrow. Uh, and I'm sure you know that song. It was well famous. Yeah, absolutely. And... Uh, of course, the Merseys were, were the singers from the Mersey Beats, who were also well famous, uh, and they were a Liverpool band, part of that Liverpool Mersey Beats explosion. And um, they asked me, I joined the band, I, I, I went in their backup band, and uh, that introduced me more to, oh, I don't know, going to London, you know, playing around there, mm -hmm. going to France, playing over there, just getting around the world a little bit, you know. And I spent, I would say, let's see, 18, that'll be 65. I spent about two and a half years in the masterminds, uh, touring and, and the like. Uh, really enjoyed it. And again, you know, improving my playing, improving my singing. Uh, and we had, we had a hell of a time in that band. That was a bunch of teenage guys knocking around Liverpool. You know, it was great. Um uh, just a lot of fun learning to socialize, you know, learning to meet people. I was you know, raised in a, in, in like a, a Catholic family, five brothers, and uh, no girls, no daughters, no sisters. And so I didn't know anything about women, anything about girls. Uh, you, you certainly would have learned fast being a musician. Well, I started to meet them, but I was so shy, and, and uh, I really didn't know how to, how to react around, around girls. I really didn't, and I'd, when they'd start laughing, I'd start getting embarrassed, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm going to get out of there, and I don't know. Uh, it seemed like they were laughing at me, you know, so. Anyway, you know how that is for guys when they first get around girls. It's, it's difficult, man, it's difficult. Um, uh, so, you know, but the rest of it was, was just a, a real blast playing. Uh, I, I grew to lo really love it. Um, playing in the band, I mean, with other, other players and rocking and rolling. Yeah. And uh, that's, where I, that's where I really became like a rock and roll player uh, right. rather than a, like a pop, a real pop musician kind of thing. Right. Uh, I love to play rock and roll beat music. You know, that's what we're great at in Liverpool, man. You yeah. know, that's what was different about Liverpool music, I think, was the beat. Uh, they, you know, we were called beat groups. That's what we were called. Uh -huh. uh, in those how, days. Would you, we went, how would you describe that beat? Uh, well, we play all, all our favourite songs uh, and we would play them all. Most of them were, uh, you know, all American songs, Chuck Berry, Little Richard, um, some of the black singers, Arthur Alexander, uh, the Stax musicians, of course. Uh, um, just, that, just that kind of stuff, you know, teenage beat music. And uh, we had a great time. Motown came out then in the early 60s. We started to learn rhythm parts and uh, really admire those players. You know, we found out who they were, James Jameson and that. And, you know, uh, James Burton, uh, uh, um, Chuck Berry, of course, Little Richard, just astounding players, you know. Uh, and, we, and we really tried to be like them. We really yeah. liked, tried to play yeah. like them. It was a great. It was a great. It was a great time to be making music, wasn't it? Oh, it was incredible. Yeah, and it was all real music. You know, of course, there were no synthesizers, no drum machines. You know, the drummer played the drums, the bass player played the bass, the guitar player played the guitars, and the piano player played the the piano or the organ. In a lot of cases, uh, as the beat groups got more popular, the manufacturers started to cater to us a little bit. You know, they made really good amplifiers. They started to get, you know, better and better, the quality of them. And um, although, and this is another funny thing, most of us have gone back to using the old equipment. You know what I mean? Is that weird? It's, <laughs> is it's, that... it's funny I mean... you say that because this radio show 
my show called A Breath of Fresh Air. I have a fabulous sound engineer who's based in Brazil. So I send him my files and he mixes and masters the show for it. So it sounds really slick and professional. But he's yeah. really super excited. He's found a 70s sort of filter that he puts over the top of the whole show. So yeah, yeah. That That's exactly right. In that sound, yeah. Yeah, I've just gone out and bought myself a Neumann 87. A U87 mic, it's uh, the best mic in the world, I think. Uh, and when you sing into it, you, it makes you feel like you can sing. It, it, it's astounding. You know, I've just made a record in in uh, in Nashville. Uh, a fellow named Phil Solom from the Rembrandt, who you might have heard of, I'm sure you'd have. Of course. And uh, Phil is a great friend of mine. Uh, and a, a great friend of ours, Jeff Miller, who's a musician, singer, songwriter, uh, out of Green Bay, Wisconsin, uh, the three of us went to Nashville to Phil's place and we recorded a bunch of Chuck Berry songs. Not really a tribute record to Chuck, but we all love him so much and we always wanted to, to, to record his songs, but of course, Chuck already killed those songs, you know what I mean? I mean, his performances of them are without PA, you know? So uh, doing a tribute to him seems a bit like, you know, futile from our standpoint but we did go in and record the songs at Phil's house and uh, just played them like we were sitting around a campfire uh, had a couple of beers and played those songs you just had yeah. a great time what would yeah. tell us you tell us your favorite song from from the ones you recorded there oh well it's impossible to say that's my dog and he's shouting out uh he's that's shouting out Johnny usually... Johnny be, he's shouting out Johnny be good <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah you know we it's... did a bit of a thing with it we we uh, we put um, Bye Bye Johnny, which is another song about Johnny B. Good. Uh, we, we, we put them both together. I used the Johnny B., the Bye Bye Johnny bit as a bridge for the Johnny B. Good song. Oh. So uh, it's kind of interesting, little interesting stuff like that. And I think we did a good job uh, in terms of rocking them, playing them like rock, rock songs uh, and, and showing our love for them. I no, we didn't do. try and do great, perfect versions or anything. Uh, we just tried to play them good and enjoy them. Make so them has, that, has that been released already or you just... Uh, no, it hasn't been released yet. It's not even finished yet. Phil is still working on the mix. Right. Um, and we've all got to, uh, because of the nature of it, we've got to do a little bit of guitar overdub uh, here and there, maybe fix a lyric here and there. You know what I mean? So we're, yeah, we're yeah. in that process. Right. right. Okay. Well, we'll we'll yeah. certainly look forward to hearing that when it comes out. So take us, Joey Mullen, now to Badfinger. Originally called the Ivies. Why did you change your name to Badfinger in the first place? Well, the the, the and they told me this. The Ivies initially were a a beat group in, from Swansea. Uh, eventually, of course, Tommy Evans joined them, and he was from Liverpool. But they seemed they were a beat group. Uh, when they went to London and started to try and be a, a songwriting band, and the, they turned into like a pop band. Uh, uh, and they really missed playing that rock and roll beat music. And so they wanted to remind themselves of that. And so they wanted a name that suggested that. They didn't think the Ivies did that. So they did, and they thought, and they thought, and they thought. I was in the band by now. Uh, they thought, and they thought, and... Um, Neil Aspinall, who was one of the Beatle roadies, as you'll recall, if you know your Beatle history, uh, mm -hmm. Neil Aspinall said, what about Badfinger? And uh, he told us it was an old blues record that he had, Badfinger Boogie. And it, it turned out that, that he made that up. It was actually, Badfinger Boogie was the working title for John Lennon playing uh, for the demo of... Um, I think a little help from my friends, the, the song from uh, Sergeant Pepper, and John played piano on it, and he goofed up a couple of times, so they called it Bad Finger Boogie. And mm -hmm. so that's where our name came from. Oh, uh, yeah, but it happened in that short period after I joined the band, uh, and then we went in and started to record the No Dice album. You know? So, I mean, you, you were a hit from the get-go as when you became known as Badfinger, weren't you? And you became the first band to be signed to Apple Records, which, of course, was the label founded by the Beatles in 1968. Well, How did that you know, come about? Well, well, Badfinger was already signed 
uh, to Apple. Um, and there's, there's a story there that the, the manager of the, uh, the bad thing, the Ivies, was a guy named Bill Collins. He was an older guy from Liverpool, played the piano. Musician, played jazz piano uh, in, in the old days, before the pop uh, boom. And uh, he happened to be acquainted with Paul McCartney's dad uh, through that music scene back then, because Paul McCartney's dad played jazz. Uh, as well, and uh, through that, Paul used. I mean, when years go by now, the Bill Collins becomes Ivy's manager, and uh, he uses that slight connection with Paul McCartney's dad to get into Abbey Road Studios and talk to Paul briefly. Uh, just introduces himself, tells him he knows his dad and all that. And Paul's a really nice, sociable guy, you know, uh, in that kind of circumstance. And uh, Paul, I mean, Bill Collins tells Paul about the Ivies, his, this band that he's managing, and their songwriters. And he had a tape with him, and he, and he gave it to Paul. The songs, well, the songs were kind of twee. They were early songs. Uh, if you understand the expression, Twee. Well, uh, we do. Uh, okay. The, the, uh, and so uh, Paul, you know, he wasn't knocked out, but he liked it enough to say, maybe if you can give us some more songs, some tapes. You know, so Bill eventually gave him three tapes of, of songs. And uh, they decided that they were going to sign the Ivies, the Beatles, I mean, decided they were going to sign the Ivies to Apple Publishing, the music company they formed. And then shortly after that, they formed Apple Records and they signed uh, the Ivies to that. To, to, and their first record came out on that, which was um, a bunch of their own songs uh, and a, a big single, um, Maybe Tomorrow, that Tommy Evans wrote. And uh, they had an album come out called Maybe Tomorrow. Um, it didn't do a lot, unfortunately. And maybe it was a bit of a hit in Italy, I think but nowhere, nowhere else really. Um, and so uh, it came to pass that, that the bass player, Ron, the bass player of the Ivies, I mean, did an interview. This is a year later or so, you know, 1969, yeah. Yeah. Uh, about what it was like working with the Beatles. And Ron said, and I don't know if I'm quoting him directly, but to paraphrase him, he said, well, it hasn't done us much good. Uh, you know, we haven't had much sex, much success. And uh, so, you know, it really hasn't, you know, helped us that much, you know. So uh, apparently uh, Paul McCartney read this, this article and it, and it kind of annoyed him, you know what I mean? <laughs> and he had a song he'd written for Ringo's new movie. The Magic Christian, and the song was called Come and Get It. And he took it right round to the Ivies and he told them that if they learned this song just like, like it was on his demo, and his demo's been released, so you can you can have a listen to it. Uh, if they if the Ivies learned that song like that, he would come round the following week, take them to Abbey Road and uh, produce them. He would make that their next their next single. Mm -hmm. And it would be their first hit record, he told them. Uh, and because uh, he didn't want anybody saying working with the Beatles didn't do much good, you know. So, well, so he did good that. Luck. So, he, yeah, so he did that and uh, very generously. Um, and they recorded the song. And of course, they had it in the can. Now, this is when Ron, the, the bass player, uh, did, did the thing and moved, left the band. You know, we had a girl, they had a, they were expecting a baby, and he decided he wanted to go home and kind of settle down and be with his family, raise his children and all that. And so he went. And the Ivy started looking for a replacement. And uh, that's where you come in. And that's where I came in, yeah. Because they decided they were going to look for a guitar player. And uh, somebody recommended me, a fellow named Billy Kinsley. And there's a bit of a story there. Uh, he was in the Mersey's. He was one of the singers in the Mersey's. Remember, I joined their backup band a few years before this. Uh -huh. So he recommended me for the job, and I went down and auditioned, and they gave me the job. So, so, so the Ivies 
that later became Badfinger was already really happening with uh, with a hit uh, in terms of uh, having a hit with Come and Get It by the time well, you come, came into no, the band. No. Well, what, what had happened was uh, the, band, the, the record was in the can. It hadn't come out yet. Ah. So when when it came out, I was in the band, and they actually put me on the cover on the on the well not on not a, with the photograph, but they wrote the bad thing of a four, and the four of us were Tommy and and Pete and Mike and Joey, uh, like John Paul George and Ringo, you know it was all it was all rolling uh-huh. along like that. So I was in the band, although I hadn't played on the record. Yeah. Wow. The uh, the former bass player must have been kicking himself. <laughs> I imagine you was when that record became such a such a big hit. Well, uh, well, although, can... oh, don't know. Hello, yeah. hello, man. Oh, you, we can you see don't. you. We we can see you, Wayne. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking you're Wayne anyway. You're not a jailer, yeah. Looks like a barred window <laughs> behind you. Yeah. It does. Anyway, anyway, the 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 record came out and it was a huge hit, and I was in the band. What the heck? <laughs> So how did you handle the success of that, Joey Molland? What did that feel like for you? It was a bit of a, bit of a double-edged coin, really. The, you know, the, obviously the success and the being on TV and my mum and dad, you know, seeing me and all that stuff. And I was starting to make regular money. I mean, you know, we were making £30 a week or £20 a week when we were in the Ivies, you know, in, in, in bad thing I like. And so that was good money for me. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, so it was great. On the other hand, because I wasn't on on the record, I felt kind of a bit felt kind of a bit, bit guilty, you know, uh, especially when they put my name on the record album, and uh, you know the Ivy's the Bad Finger album came out called Magic Christian Music, and uh, there was the picture of Tommy and, and Pete and Mike and me on the front, and I had I had a little mention on the back that I was in the band, uh, so that was my claim to fame then. Um, of course, I was on all the other records. We went right in and did the No Dice album, yeah. and so that kind of alleviated that feeling. Yeah. So and, you, so, uh, you, so you had a bit of imposter syndrome on the first one on Come and Get It, but by the time, no matter what, and day after day came, you were right in there and and on the recordings, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So who? Played like, who I'm sorry. Go ahead. Who came up with No Matter What? Oh, it was a Peter Ham song. Uh, it was the first song we recorded as Bad Finger. Um, knock out, knock out, little tune, and uh, we gave it to 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 the uh, to Apple. Uh, and they did, they thought it was good, but they didn't really think it was a single. And uh, so they they told us to go in and record more songs, and we did, uh, which eventually became the the uh, the No Dice album. Uh, I had a few songs on the record, three or four. Uh, which I was really happy about, uh, but still they ended up going back to no matter what, uh, and that came out as the next single after uh, after you know after Magic Christian. All right. I'm having a cup of tea. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. Please do. Um, your your mum and dad must have been awfully proud of you by this time. I'm sure that they tried to convince you from an early age not to make music your full time career and to stick with your regular job, didn't they? Yeah, no, well, no, they they were they they really uh, they really encouraged me to play the guitar. Uh, they didn't try and influence me to be a musician, but they'd like sit me on the couch and have me play songs for them and do all that, you know. So yeah. they were really happy about it. Of course, I'd been with Badfinger. I mean, with the masterminds yeah. and the bands around Liverpool. Uh, been in the newspaper a couple of times, things like that. So uh, they kind of had an idea, I suppose, that I was going to, you know, be a musician. But uh, when they saw me on TV, they were obviously very excited about all that. Yeah, uh, sure. And I'm working, you know, doing the stuff, uh, doing the Bad Finger, Bad Finger album, and uh, then having the big hit record in America. Yeah, they were knocked out. Just knocked out, of course. Yeah. I mean, you guys must have been incredibly surprised at the success that you did find in America because it was pretty unusual, wasn't it? I mean, making it in America, being a success in America, was the epitome. Was on everybody's wish list. In the in. in the- that's exactly that's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, you know, before the Beatles, there had never been anybody who'd been successful here, and then came the Beatles. Um, actually, Dick Clark, uh, uh, not Dick Clark, but. Uh, what was his name? Clark, the band. You know that band? Dave Clark. I can't remember it. I Dave can't, Clark. 
Dave, Dave Clark. Clark. Yeah, Dave Clark. Fine, yeah. Uh, Thanks, Wayne. I'm sorry I couldn't remember his name. Yeah, no, 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 that's all right. I'm yeah. editing. It's not a problem. Dave Clark. Yeah, right. and, and uh, he, came over, he, he came over first, didn't he? Didn't he have the first hit record here in the English band scene? And then the Beatles came, of course, and, and the Beatles got ginormous and all the other bands came over, the Animals and, you know, the Stones and all that happened. And so a lot of bands had been popular by the time we came out. Uh, not that we weren't happy to be successful in America. Yeah. Boy, we came over here, we started playing and we played pretty much anywhere. We played in school gyms, high schools. Uh, we played in field houses. We played... Uh, you know, anywhere they'd book us, really. Little clubs, big clubs, you know, famous places, unknown places. Uh, we played all over the country. We'd, we'd come and do these 90-day tours. We were here for three months, and we'd do 60 shows uh, in those days. And that went on for, you know, the next, I guess, two or three years, uh, playing all those shows. We sold a lot of places out, had tremendous times, Man, we were going in, you know, Chicago, New York, you know, all these cities, Dallas, uh, uh, <laughs> San Antonio, Houston, Miami, you know, all of these places. It was fantastic. Washington, D.C., you know what I mean? California, we even made it out there. Uh, just incredible. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, when, when, you, when you refer to here, of course, you live in the US now, and those 90 day tours are something that you can really only do when you're super young and fit and energetic, can't you? You couldn't imagine doing oh, that sort of stuff well, today. It was, yeah, it was incredible. It was incredible. I still do uh, package tours, and some I've got a Joey Mullins Badfinger show. Uh, because I don't want anybody thinking I'm bringing the original band, of course, because the, the other three guys aren't with us anymore. Oh, so uh, I don't call the band Badfinger for that reason, really. Uh, uh, but it is Joey Mullins' Badfinger, no doubt about it. Yeah. And uh, we feature all the hits and all that stuff and uh, a lot of the, the uh, lesser-known songs yeah. in, in the shows that we do. Have a Joey, great time doing it. Sorry, yeah, I bet you do. Um, Joey, so you, Badfinger went on to sell 14 million albums worldwide, scoring three top 10 US hits between 1970 and 1972. Yeah. That yeah. was Come and Get It, the one you've spoken about, written by Paul McCartney, No Matter What, and, of course, that fabulous song Day After Day. Um, yeah. <laughs> it, it felt pretty good, huh? Oh, it was great. I, I tell you one other thing that felt pretty good. I met my wife, Kathy, uh, on, on that first tour of America. And, uh, you know, we were, we were married until she passed away in 2009. Uh, now I have a sweetheart named Mary. But uh, I had to mention Kathy and all of that because she was such a big part of my life then, of course. Uh, but anyway, we... we uh, we went on where, where, where I'm sorry, where you talked about well, I was I was where I was going to go next was um you mentioned you mentioned earlier Peter Ham who had written No Matter What, he he wrote a lot for the band. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about Peter, because of course he came to a tragic end at just the tender age of twenty seven, didn't he? He did, yes. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. Uh Peter, of course, wrote all the hits that the band had. He wrote uh day after day, um no matter what, uh, Baby Blue, which is a tremendous, uh, it could be my favourite uh, out of all those songs. Mm. Um, he wrote all of those and a lot of great songs. Uh, you know, Lonely You comes to mind. Uh, uh, just stuff like Matt and Spam, uh, um, Name of the Game, uh, Take It All, just a, a load of them. Super popular songs. Yeah. Uh, and they're not, they're not as well known as they should be. Uh, of course, amongst the Badfinger uh, uh, fans, the you know the people who like Badfinger, they're they're very they're very well known and very well liked. I feature a lot of those songs in the show I do. Yeah, um, just great. Uh, he was a great guy, funny, uh, um, played practical jokes uh, all the time, and um, a trusting, very trusting man. And he trusted the manager. Uh, even though uh, we tried to, uh, uh, and when we found out what was going on uh, inside the management, uh, uh, and we found out about that, uh, 
we started to talk about leaving the management and getting new managers. And Peter would, would not go along with it. Uh, he thought that the manager was lovely and, and that he was a great guy and uh, he wouldn't have anything said against him. And in fact, the guy was a crook. Yeah, and when, when, you, talk, when the, you talk about when you talk about the management being crooked, uh, I'm I'm well aware that he would take all of the money from you and distribute nothing to the band, right? Well, we did. We know we, we you know to be fair, we got a monthly stipend. Uh, we took three hundred dollars a week, uh, uh, but mind you, we were making oh I don't know three hundred thousand dollars a week. You might say. Uh, he told her he took seven million dollars from us. Uh, was was the, the amount that the accountants came up with? Uh, never paid us back. Uh, the only way we got any of the money uh, out of the entire Bad Finger experience, uh, and I'm talking about the successful Bad Finger experience, was because we went to Apple and we asked them not to pay any more royalties out. Asked them to keep all the money. A lot of people thought that Apple was involved in taking our money and keeping our money, but in fact, that's what happened. We asked them not to pay any of the money out. And they did that. They went to court in London and gave all our royalties to the court, you know, because they knew, they knew it wasn't their money and they didn't want anybody saying that they had kept bad fingers money. Yeah. Uh, and they always treated us like, I think, 100% above board. You know, like a like a rock band would treat another rock band. You yeah. know what I mean? So during um, this, so during this time when you're on top of the world, you've got several top ten hits uh, everywhere. You you were really suffering. You were getting a, a pittance as a as a wage. And I know that you tell the story that that you were often standing in line for food stamps and the like, trying to support your family. Oh, we were. Well, we, 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 I tell you, when the band broke up. Um, uh, that was in 75, uh, early 75, really, uh, late 74. I was already gone by the end of 74. Um, and the band broke up completely shortly after that. I think they made one more record. Um, and Peter found out that, that uh, all the money was gone. He had nothing. He couldn't even buy his, his girl who was going into hospital to have babies, so, you know, to have a baby, the, his first child. He couldn't even buy it a 90. You know, he was told he had no money. And Peter, above us all, because of those songs that he wrote, he should have been a multimillionaire. Yeah. He should have been a multimillionaire, there's no doubt. Uh, and of course, when he found that out, it destroyed him. Uh, and he went out, I think, that night or the next night, and, uh, and, and he committed suicide. Um, he went out with Tommy. They had a few drinks and... He went home, and that night he, he, he you know, he, he did did what he did, and uh, it was a disaster. And yes, at that time we were all in the same boat. We were selling everything. Uh, I'd moved to America, uh, and of course in America uh, we didn't get any welfare, or rather, I, I didn't go and sign on welfare or anything. Uh, I was fortunate enough to meet an old friend of mine from Liverpool, and he gave me a job. Uh, working as a carpenter and uh, and then I got another job from some friends I'd made American friends, I installed carpet uh, for about six months a year uh, then my first son was born in 1979 Sean and uh, even by then I hadn't, uh, hadn't been able to establish any kind of uh, good career for myself um the whole bad finger thing had, had, had gone away. That there were no records in the stores. We really weren't getting any play on the radio anymore. Um, Apple uh, uh, and uh, Warner Brothers had pulled all our records from the world from the the stores for whatever reason, and uh, so there was no income, no income for us. None of us. Tommy got a job uh, lagging pipes, which is installing electrical systems and uh, insulating the pipes uh, and the water systems in houses. Tommy was doing that. Uh, Mike had gone back uh, playing an occasional uh, drum uh, drum session and playing around in Swansea uh, with his old friends from his childhood. And uh, that's basically, uh, you know, what happened to us. 
um, it was a bit of it was a nightmare time. It was a nightmare time. I remember, and I do remember being in the poor uh, line at, at the Pasadena emergency clinic because my son Sean uh, was uh, very ill, uh, and I couldn't afford medicine. I couldn't afford a doctor. Uh, and I didn't know anything about how these systems work in America. All I knew was that uh, it wasn't like a welfare state like in England where you never get in that position in England. You know what I mean? There is, there is help for you. Uh, anyway, um, that, that, that's how the experience was. And then, of course, things develop. You know, you, you, know, you, you find a gig, you start playing again and... You know what I mean? Things start to work out. It does come back, but I mean, it's 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 unthinkable that at the height of your success, when you you had all of those hits, when you'd been performing on George Harrison's "All Things Must Pass," when uh, he had played with you, George Harrison played with you. He played slide guitar on day after day, as well as producing the second album. Um, when Tommy was featured on "I Don't Want to Be a Soldier" on on John Lennon's 1971 album "Imagine." You guys I played were... on that too. We both played on that. Did you? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, jealous guy as well. Really? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And and of course, Peter Ham had written that all time fabulous song. I mean, he's got a list as long as a as your arm of songs he's written, but he'd written that fabulous song without you for Nilsson. Yeah, he had. Yeah, actually, he and Tommy uh, wrote that song. Uh, it was a com- it was a uh, a combination of two songs. Uh, Tommy had the chorus, I can't live, living this without you. And Peter had the verse, uh, I can't forget this evening, know that part. And we stuck the both ideas together. Uh, and that was a suggestion of the manager, Bill Collins, our old manager. And he wasn't the crook, incidentally. Oh. Uh, the crook was a New York guy named Stan Polly. Oh. Uh, I'll say that again. It was a New York guy named Stan Polly. <laughs> and what, uh, just and what, so we're clear on that. Just so what, we're absolutely clear. Yeah. And what became of him, Joey, Stan Polly? Pardon? And what became of Stan Polly? Oh, he passed away. Ah, yeah. he deserved to. He went out and he, he, he went out, you know, he, he was known then in the business, uh, you know, because of the bad finger thing. He, he got, you know, he was known as that kind of person. So his, his career went downhill in the music. But in, um, you know, Stan Polly managed uh, Al Cooper. He managed... Uh, um, Lou Christie. Uh-huh. Uh, so uh, you don't hear much from them about that, but but he did, and uh, so he was quite really quite successful. Uh, after after the music business, he went out west, and he tried to pull the same scam on a uh, an engineering guy, a fellow who made and designed jet engines. He tried to do that. Well, that guy wasn't having any of it. He went right to the police, and they busted him. Of course, Badfinger weren't smart enough to go to the police. <laughs> and ever since then, I've advised all the young musicians that I know that if you ever get in a situation like that where someone's stealing your money, go to the police because it is illegal. Yeah. You know, yeah. the Bunko yeah. Squad will take care of it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, yeah, yeah it, was a, it all ended up as a bit of a nightmare. But yeah. you know what? Because of Apple's, yeah. Uh, good behavior all the apple royalties that means all the royalties from day after day and baby blue and no matter what and without you and all the record sales from the bad finger records all that money went into the bank in london and it was held by the courts of england nobody could get it and in 1985 we went to court of course tommy had passed away by then uh but Mike and I and Bill Collins, the original manager, uh, went to, went to court in London and we got the money, and we and we, we got it all divided up uh, according to our agreements because we had our band agreement, you know, uh, how the money was. And ever, ever since then, each member of the band, including Tommy and Pete or their estates, uh-huh. have received every single penny of his royalties. Great. And uh, you know, we've been able to live. A decent life, not not a not a crazy life. Of course, I've been working all that time, playing shows and uh, doing all that. Mike Gibbons did the same, um, and Tommy did in the early days. 
Uh, but we did, you know, we, we necessarily couldn't make the kind of money we could with the bad thing abandoned. Uh, so, uh, but you know, we've all been fortunate enough to live really pretty decent lives and raise our children and, uh, you know, and pay our bills. You know what right. I mean? And so, that's really so, all you can ask for, isn't it? Yeah, you know? that's right. So a happy ending, but uh, yeah. a, a bit of a roller coaster ride through through the entirety of Badfinger for sure. Um, yeah. Joey, these days. I know that you made great use of the pandemic time because you got together with some of your friends and produced and released your sixth, oh, it's hard to say, your sixth solo album, which is called Be True to Yourself. Can you share a little bit with us about Be True to Yourself? Sure. Uh, it's a collection of songs that I've written over the years. Uh, and I've got a very good friend. His name is Mark Hudson. Uh, and you might be familiar with Mark. He's going to you know, Grammy-winning producer, uh, Ringo Starr's records uh, for many years, um, Aerosmith. You know, he, he's made a lot of great records, plus his own recordings, uh, and a great record producer. We became friends over the years. And uh, one, one day he asked me, did I want to make a record? And, of course, I did. Um, and it's cutting a, a bit of a story, long story short, but uh, we, you know, we did. We decided to go in. We found some money. Uh, it's an angel that we met, Jeff Miller, uh, and he was nice enough to to, to help us in that that sense. Um, and we went to uh, New York and we recorded uh, ten of my songs, uh, and I think they turned out really pretty good. Uh, the reviews when the record came out were ecstatic. Um, uh, I made a couple of videos, did all the digital stuff. You know, I, I've got no idea about how the record business works nowadays. Uh, so uh, it's not just putting a record out and seeing if it sells. You know, it's you have to do most of that work that the record company used to do. Yeah. You have to do that yourself. Yeah, I get it. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of work and, and oh, you need you need experts to do yeah. it. So uh, I hired a few guys, but uh, unfortunately, my record didn't take off. Even though everybody said it was the best record we'd ever made, <laughs> it didn't matter. Uh, it there's didn't? a few good. I, th I think, no, oh, no, it never really sold a lot. It's, it sells okay. I think it's still selling a lot. It's kind of like a bad thing, a record in that way. It, you know, it keeps on selling here and selling there and selling this. Oh. I made a couple of videos. When you, um, you've, got, you've got some pretty big name players on there with you, don't you? Oh, yeah, yeah. Some people were nice enough to come down and sing and play. Uh, uh, of course, Mark was on the record. Uh, Julian Lennon came and sang on a few songs for us. Loved that, Julian. Thanks so much. And, uh, you know, uh, Mickey Dolans came and sung, sang a song on with us. And uh, Jason Sheff, uh, the singer from Chicago now, uh, absolutely brilliant singer, came in and sang with me. And uh, a lot of different players uh Maybe a little bit less known, but came and played people from the from the Aerosmith crowd, uh, people from uh, uh, you know the New York City uh, uh, bunch, and there's a lot from New York, uh, and some of the young heroes, uh, people who you don't know of them, but like uh, one guy, uh, uh, he goes to, to uh, Egypt and places like that, and plays in the public squares and sings songs about freedom. Huh? Uh, and songs about rights and songs about things like that it takes a tremendous amount of courage because uh, mm. you know you're going to get arrested and you know you're going to jail. And uh, there were people like that playing on it. And uh, just, so just wonderful, uh, wonderful musicians, you know. Yeah, it, it, I think it's a fabulous album. It's been called very Beatlicious. It well, yeah, well, uh, yeah, well, it is, it is Beatlish. Uh, uh, I don't think all the songs are Beatles, but the, the but the treatment of them, uh, and you know, I've got to give a lot of credit for that to Mark uh, Hudson, who's a he's as big a Beatles fan as I am. You know, I mean, I I love the Beatles, man. Uh, you know, wow, can you imagine what it was like getting to play uh, on those records with George and John? Uh, it was just incredible. We did the Bangladesh concert with George too. Uh, Eric Clapton, in his biography, calls us uh, George. He says George Harrison and, and George's band Badfinger. That's what he called it. So, uh, which is a hell of a deal, isn't it? 
Absolutely. Uh, it doesn't get better than that, does it? No, it doesn't. And, uh, you know, I've been able to work the rest of my life, uh, mainly because I was in bad finger, for sure. Uh, I like to think it's because I bring a bit of energy to the, to the show. Uh, you know, you want to bring music. When you play music, uh, you want it to, well, I want it to be alive. I don't want it to be, uh, you know, like a, a perfect copy of this sort of thing, because this is today, you know? It's not yesterday, and it's not tomorrow. And I play the songs like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I play day after day with the same form, you know, the intro, the verses, the choruses are in the same form, but I can't guarantee it's going to be exactly the same every day. So uh, that's my attitude towards playing. It always has been. Yeah. Uh, I just think I like that too, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Joey Mullen, point us to your favourite track. I know it's not, a, it's, a, it's a hard ask because they're all like children, but which one would you like us to listen to now from, from the new album? Um. Boy, I'm I'm torn there. Uh, All right, you can you can give me. A you know, there's, there's there's a song on there uh, uh, called uh, um, "Shine," uh, which was a song I wrote in like oh, 1973. Yeah, uh, we made Badfinger recorded it uh, as a demo, but we never put it on a record. Um, uh, so Pete wrote the chorus. Actually, I made the chorus up. Uh, and I, 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 I talked to them about it. And, uh, you know, they were so, I got to say this, they're, they're, they're really angry with me for some reason. They, the, Ham, the Hammer State are really angry with me for some oh. reason. Yeah, they are. And uh, so they wouldn't, they, didn't, they said Pete didn't want any credit. They, 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 didn't, they didn't want him to have credit on the song. So, okay. Uh, you know, it's a shame because they're the kind of vibes that go around those kind of scenes, uh, those, the, 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 those bands with stories like Badfinger. There's always that kind of, uh, I don't know, thing that tries to turn it into something it's not. But um, anyway, I like, so I like that song and I like to play it because it's a great little song and it's completely different from other people's songs. And uh, there were a few on there that, that were singles um, uh, uh, um, man, Rainy Day Man uh, is really good and I'll tell you Rainy Day Man the idea came from a guy named uh, Gary Bear, an American singwriter a guy, he's an American singwriter, a member of the Hall of Fame um, you know and he sent us the idea uh, so we finished the song, Mark and I and we put it on, it turned out great and uh, so we made it the single, it was the first single and then there's a few other ones that are like that. Uh, the title song, uh, Yesterday, a uh, song about um, the first real conversation I ever had with my eldest brother. Yeah, my eldest brother was like 15, 16 years older than me. Huh. You know, And uh, one day, one night, years and later, we were both getting on and we had a conversation and I wrote a song about that conversation. Um uh, so the, the, it's a pretty good song and, and uh, pretty nice. Are you still it's writing? Great. You still writing? Yeah, I am. Uh, I'm trying to. I'm trying to write a, uh, an album right now. Actually, I'd like maybe an EP or something. But uh, I'm working on the on the first song. Uh, it's a song called "The Human Race," and uh, what I'm trying to establish uh, through it is uh, is what I believe in. In that we we're the human race. And we're a, we're a bunch of different tribes, maybe, but we're all the same, you know, we're all the same race. Uh, and, and I really want that to become the attitude of us. Or I, I want us to think of ourselves as the human race, not as uh, white guys and black guys and yellow guys and red guys and, you know, all of that kind of bullshit. Uh, 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 you know, we're a human race and let's face it, let's, Let's make a, make our history great, you know. Sounds, uh, so it, it sounds that's like where a I'm terrific at. thought. That's awesome. And you still got the antique store there in Minnesota? Yeah, we have a couple of antique stores. My, my girl Mary and I we, we call it Joe Ma, you know, for Joe and Mary. And uh, 
yeah, we sell knickknacks and stuff like that and beautiful vases and uh, any kind of beautiful art antique we can find uh, at a reasonable price, I might add. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and we sell it for a reasonable profit. But uh, it's a lot of fun. And, you know, we're like most people on this planet. We like to go rummaging, you know. Uh, we love to go rummaging and you know you end up with a house full of rummage <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah I can, so I can relate to that yeah so we're trying to do that you know and I've got a fabulous record collection you know from doing that uh, awesome. just great things guitars even uh, you know when we were bad thinking in the big days uh, we spend most of our days off in music stores and pawn shops, looking for guitars and looking for, uh, you know, a little old amplifiers and any anything like that. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. And I still Sorry. love all of that. All of that side of the musician's life is one of the great treats for you. Uh, Sorry, finding a, a, you know, it's fabulous. Yeah. Here. Um, Sorry, oh, um, Joey, yeah, but before I, before I let you do, before I do let you go, Joey, um, Wayne does have a couple of questions for you. Wayne, what do you want to ask Joey? No, I was just just interested in talking about guitars. Joey, how many guitars have you got? Um, I've still got about twenty. Um, <laughs> and what I do is I'll, I'll sell a few after a while and and get other ones. You know, yeah. like I just picked up a nineteen sixty four Harmony uh, Bobcat Silhouette model. Uh, two pickup models, fantastic. Uh, I've got a bunch of Gibsons, which are my favourites. Uh, I, sh I shouldn't be shouting that out, but uh, yeah, I, I love Gibson Les Pauls and SG, SG standards in particular. Uh, but I've got a, I've got a bunch of them. Um, what else have I got? I've got a Gibson acoustic, a Martin, of course, uh, uh, and little little acoustics. I've got a Students acoustic, which is a beautiful little guitar for children and it plays great looks great uh, i've got plastic guitars which aren't supposed to be really taken seriously but i happen to really enjoy them uh, i got one maybe 25 years ago maybe longer than that I mean, 35 years maybe even uh, it still works you know what i mean it's got a little plug-in thing you put a battery in, in the little plastic box on it <laughs> and it works i love it um so and that's about it i've got a bass i've got an old fender bass uh stuff like that you know i like it. are you a guitarist on. are you a guitarist what? yourself wayne um i've i've got a got a little acoustic yeah but a guitarist no, <laughs> no. i've got a i've got a i've got a guitar that a chap named john schneider gave me and I still have it, and I do play it, John. I know I haven't played it. But, uh, I do play it, man. Don't, don't yeah. be worried. Uh, Anything anyway, else you yeah, want to I, ask, I, An Australian guy. Yeah, Joey, I, I really wanted to ask you, you know, like the, the two guys that, um, I mean, it's not, a, it's not a real good topic, the two guys that suicided. Yeah, yeah. Um, like you're saying, Peter probably did so under, under the pressure of, of the money thing, you know, but but why did why do you think Tom Evans? Why do you think he suicided? You know, it's difficult for me to answer, and I've obviously yeah. been asked that a lot. You know, but you know, I don't really know. Although I did know Tommy really well, obviously, I lived with him for years, and uh, you know, I've got some feelings about that, but but they're just like personal thoughts that I have about it. I don't really want to discuss that with you. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, you know, and, uh, and there are children involved, you know what I mean? And I don't want to be, I don't yeah. want to offend those children. I don't want to say anything that they might not agree with, might not believe, yeah. uh, but, but things happened and, 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 you know, it's very, very sad. You know, the, the, you know, Peter and Tommy did what they did. It's, I'll never really get over it. Uh, and when I think about what we could have done together, uh, you know, how much bad thing, if we would have made a different choice as a manager, uh, I can fancy the odds that we would still be friends now and we would still play together now, you know, because we did get on great. We got on like a house on fire. If you look at the films of us on tour, um, you know, 
there were only the four of us and our two roadies and our, and our Bill Collins, our manager. That's all there ever was in the bad finger setup. Mm. Uh, I mean, of course, we had our wives and we had our girls, you know, and they were very important to us, make no mistake. But in essence, the band is the band, you know? Yeah. And so um, I'm, I'm really sure, I'd, you know, I'm really sure that we would still know each other, still be playing together, still doing a little bit here, a little bit there, maybe doing an odd gig or something, you know? Uh, you know, Tommy Evans was an unbelievable singer. And a great songwriter, a great lyricist, you yeah, know? Yeah. And a knockout guitar player. A lot of people don't know him about him. Tommy was one of those guys who would play off the top of his head and play all the right notes, you know? Uh, Peter was that way uh, in his playing, but he was a technician. You know, he'd had music lessons and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so, but a tremendous, and of course, an unbelievable singer. You know, people talk about how high Tommy could sing. Well, he could sing that high easily in that beautiful Welsh voice that he had, you know? Um, and Mike Gibbons, have you ever played with a drummer like Mike Gibbons? Have you ever heard a drummer like Mike Gibbons? Because I haven't. I <laughs> haven't, man. Uh, tremendous and a great little writer himself and a great little singer, as it happens. You know, mm. we wrote a book out of chords for Mike. Uh, we, wrote, we wrote the chords in left-handed yeah, positions, you know, because he was left-handed, so that he yeah. could learn to play left-handed, you know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. Uh, just, just a great time in my life. I'll never get over it and never forget it, and I defy anybody yeah. to say, well, that it was, it was, say anything finger, bad about that period. Bad finger was certainly marked with a bit of... Uh, with a bit of tragedy and and there is a yeah. book that was put out in 1997 called Without You the tragic story of Badfinger we're certainly glad you survived it we thank you Joey Mullen not only for your time with us today but for all the music all the songs that Badfinger gave us and I'm so happy that you're out there doing today Joey Mullen's Badfinger as well as putting <laughs> out new music it's just awesome that you continue on well, thank you very much. And I, you know, I've got in return, I have to thank all you guys and girls for, for still listening to Bad Finger Music. And you're the reason we're still on the radio all over the world. And you're the reason that we still get record royalties and all of that. 